when you plant a seed, you must reap fruit. God is a giver by nature. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Giving is the ultimate expression of love. You are never truly godly if you are not a giver. You don't really resemble God. You cannot say you are a child of God if the nature of God which is given is not in you. you the principle that the bank of heaven operates on is a principle of releasing and receiving. If you don't release, you will not receive. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for another privilege you've given us to come and sit at your feet. We pray, oh God, that even as your word is coming, you help us to open our hearts to receive your word and let your word do a work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You are welcome to uh, church one more time. Um, for the past few weeks, we've been talking about the gold head or the God head. And um, it's a series dealing with the money controversy in the church. There are a lot of controversies surrounding money in the church. Right from whether God wants his people to prosper or not whether God is against prosperity or he's not against prosperity. And why there are a lot of warnings in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, concerning covetousness. So we started off by looking at the gold head or the Godhead, and we saw the role that Mammon plays in the life of the believer. His assignment that has been given to him by the devil to make believers covetous and selfish and then to make sure that you compromise before you bring your mouth, your hand to your mouth. Then we looked at the kingdom principle of stewardship. Um, we first touched on deliverance from Satan's eating. So these are all part of the series. Deliverance from Satan's eating. The last week we looked at the kingdom principle of stewardship. And today we are looking at Understanding the bank of heaven. Understanding the bank of heaven. That there is a bank in heaven which operates on certain principles. And as believers, we have to know how the bank of heaven operates and how we can, how it relates to us as believers. Now, this bank of heaven operates on the principle of receiving and releasing receiving and releasing and receiving and releasing is the principle that sustains life on this earth for instance human beings don't need carbon dioxide so we release carbon dioxide which we don't need and the plants also need carbon dioxide, but they don't need oxygen. So they also release the oxygen which we need. And that is how life is sustained on this earth. Animals release their excreta. It fertilizes the earth. And it brings food for humans to eat. We also release. Then it goes back to the earth. And it brings food. That's the cycle of life. That is how God created um, this earth. And that is what sustains life on this earth. So from last week, we saw that whenever you hoard, you've broken the cycle of life. Whenever you hoard something, you have broken the cycle of life. Now, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 2, 22, God instituted the principle of receiving 
and release him. And, you know, right after the flood, when um, everything was going to start afresh, God spoke to Noah and said this, Genesis 8.22, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. He says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest time will not, see, will not cease. Which means, releasing and receiving will not cease. Seed time is releasing the seed. And harvest time is receiving the fruit. And he's saying that it will not cease. It is a principle. A principle simply means a fact which is timeless. Which means it is true every time, you know. And then it is also generational. It is true in every generation. It is, it is timeless and it is generational. So wherever you go in the world, seed time and harvest time is a principle. It's a law that you, wherever you are in the world, you, you will see when you plant a seed, you must reap fruit. It is, it is fixed. It's just like the law of gravity. It's everywhere. And you, everywhere you will find that law. Everywhere under the sun, you will find that when, when you throw something up, it must come down and come down because it is pulled by forces of gravity. So that is a law that God instituted, you know, right after the flood. And so the principle of receiving and releasing is simply sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping. Now, God is a giver. God is a giver by nature. That is his nature. His nature is that of a giver. He gives. Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave. For God so loved that he gave. So giving is the ultimate expression of love. For God so loved that he gave. So when you love, you give. Whoever loves, gives. So giving is an expression of love. Bible calls God a liberal giver. In James 1.5, it talks about one attribute of God. That is his liberalness. That he gives liberally. He gives. James chapter 1 verse 5. Let's read James 1.5 and look at something there. It says, he was talking about if you lack wisdom. He said, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. He gives liberally and without reproach which means that god doesn't just give he lavishes that is the god that's that's the mind of god he gives bountifully he 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 gives generously then he says without reproach without reproach he gives without reproach the king jesus he abraded not which means that he he doesn't ask questions he gives without asking questions that, 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 that's a picture of somebody who is a liberal giver. Right? He, he, he always, always giving. And when you come, he will not, he will not tell you that I'm not going to give because of this, that he's always giving. That's God. Then also, he also gives freely. In 1 Corinthians 2 12, he says, what the Holy Spirit helps us to understand or know the things which God has freely given us. Freely given us. So he gives freely. He gives freely. Then in 1 Timothy 6 17, Bible says he gives richly. He gives richly. He gives richly. It also feeds in the, in the fact that he lavishes. What God gives is rich. It is concentrated. When God is giving something to you, he will give it to you till you know that he has given to you. He doesn't give in half measures. He loves this. He's a generous giver. Let's have that picture about God. You see, one difference between the prodigal son and the elder brother was the way they saw the father. The prodigal son saw the father as a lavish giver. So even after he went and blew the father's resources, he still, he still, he still, he still uh, thought that the father could give. In fact, he even realized that by now, my father must have had other property. So let me go back and this my father, I know he will give. That is, that's the picture 
the parable is actually the parable of the Lord's love. I mean, the father's love. You know, even though we focus on the prodigal son, it was to teach about the love of God. That God is a liberal giver. God is somebody who loves his children. He's somebody who wants them well. He wants them well. That is God's plan for you. Amen. Then he gives all things. Romans 8.32 He said, if he has given us Jesus Christ, will he not also with him give us all things? Give us all things. In 2 Peter 1, 2 to 3, he said, God has given us all that pertains to life and godliness. He has given us all that pertains to life and godliness. That is the goal we serve. So, when God is your father, he thinks about your life all around. He thinks about every aspect of your life. He is interested in every aspect of your life. And he wants to give in every aspect of your life. God is not just interested in your spiritual aspect. You know, he's interested in your life, your very life. He said, all that pertains, all, all is all. All means everything that has got to do with your life and godliness. And in Genesis 24 verse 1, Bible says, and God had blessed Abraham in all things. God has had blessed Abraham. He said, Abraham was old and well stricken in years and God had blessed him in all things. Which means that the blessing of God is all around. He had blessed him in all things. Blessed him in goods, material goods. Bless him in peace. Bless him in fruitfulness. Bless him in every area of his life. So Abraham, and the Bible said that when he was old, God had blessed him in all things. You know, we'll, 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 we'll learn something from, from that in subsequent um, lessons. Now, so you are never truly godly if you are not a giver. You don't really resemble God. You cannot say you are a child of God if the nature of God, which is given, is not in you. If you are stingy, you are not resembling God. You are not behaving like God. In fact, when, the, when we read the Bible in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, it talks about the stages of maturity we go through. He said, uh, giving all diligence add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love or agape. So you see the process that he he goes through before he got to love. Which means that God's nature is ultimately expressed in love. It starts from faith and then it ends in love. When you become born again, he deals, he deals um, with you a measure of faith. Romans 12, 3, he said, according to the measure of faith that God has dealt with everybody. But that measure of faith must grow and you must add to that faith virtue and knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, battle kindness, you come to agape. So you start in faith, but you end in love. And love's ultimate expression is giving. So you can't say, I'm a child of God and you're not a giver. It is inconsistent with the nature of God. Number two, nobody can beat God when it comes to giving. In other words, whenever you release to God, the returns is always more than what you release. When you release something at the instance of God or in obedience to God, what you receive back is always far greater. Which means that when God asks you to give him something, it is just an opportunity to bless you. An opportunity to release something far greater and far more precious than what you, re- you, you, you release to God. So we never receive the same as we release. We receive better, you know, more than what we release to God. In Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 6, let's read Luke 5. One, let me show you something there. When somebody gave his boat to Jesus, Peter gave his boat to Jesus in Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. And look at what Jesus did. It says, 
So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets. But Simon answered and said, Master, we have told all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boat so that the, so that they began to sink. Look at what Jesus did. I mean, he blew Peter's mind. When after Peter had given his boat, he said, Peter, now let down your nets, plural, which means not one net, nets. You see, God is always thinking in terms of bountiful blessing. And we are thinking in terms of shortage. That is, that is the difference between us and God. He's always thinking of something bigger than what we are giving. He said, let down your nets. N-E-T-S. Peter said, okay, master, I will let down the nets. N-E-T. So it means that Peter was not even expecting something big. But when he let down the net, the fish he caught, it broke the net. Because anytime you release to God, what he gives you will be more than what you release. That's why I was using uh, the hand of a child as an illustration that if you tell a child, give me a handful of grain, the child will dip his hand in the sack and bring you a handful. Then he, he will put it in your hand. You will use one hand to receive it. Then you two say, okay, I'm going to give you a handful. You two will dip your hand in the sack and then give it to the child. The child must cup his hands to receive it. Why? Your handful is far bigger than the child's handful. Because your hand is bigger. You can never beat God giving. When it comes to giving, you can never beat God. Jesus took five loaves of bread from a child and two fishes. After everything, he had 12 baskets left. And I believe that 12 baskets went to the boy. Because it was his bread that he brought and Jesus multiplied it for the multitude so if there were any left over, it would have to go back to the boy. So he, he released five loaves of bread and got 12 baskets. Can you imagine? If you do the proportion, you will see that God blessed him far and beyond. Far and beyond what he released. So you can never outgive God. So when God says, give me this, what, whenever God says, give me this, what he's saying is that, what you are holding is too small. Give me, let me give you a bigger one. But human as we are, when God says give me, we think God is trying to take from us. We don't know that God is activating the law of releasing and receiving. Anytime you release at the instance of obedience, your receiving is bigger than your release. And always, God will always ask you to release something before he, re, before you receive something. God doesn't work miracles in a vacuum. He will always need something material to release material blessing. It's in the Bible. A, a widow went to Elisha and said, man of God, help me. My husband died and the creditor came to take my two sons as slaves. Elisha said, hmm, what can I do for you? What do you have in your house? What do you have in your house that I can multiply? There's something that I can, I want to get and multiply. What do you have in your house? Then she said, I only have this oil. Then she said, oh, fine. Borrow more vessels. Shut yourself in a room and begin to pour. And as she began to pour, the oil was multiplying. But Elisha could only pray for the oil to multiply because that was what the woman had. So if you don't have, that's what Jesus Christ said, he who has more will be given to him. He who does not have, even that which he has will be taken away from him. And people don't understand that. In fact, that was what 
tell Kwame Nkrumah from be, be, being a Christian to be, being uh, somebody who didn't believe in God. Because he said, it, it's, it's against socialism. Socialism doesn't say, if you don't have what you have, we'll take away from you. You know, but that's, that is God. He said, if you have what those who have, I will give them more. Why? Because I will get something to multiply back to them. It's a law of re- releasing and receiving. So he said, Moses, what do you have in your hand? I want to work a miracle for you, but what do you have in your hand? They said, a rod. Okay, cast your rod to the ground. Then the rod became a serpent. Why? That was what was in Moses' hand. And that was what God touched and made supernatural. God will always use what you have in your hand and he will multiply it back to you. That's why he said, don't appear before me empty-handed because I can't multiply anything back to you. So what do you have in your hand? Elijah didn't tell the widow of Zarephath, oh, if this is all you have, go and bake for your son like you said and go and eat. I don't want to worry you. No. He said, go and prepare, but bake for me cake first. God took what the, the little the woman had, which she was living on, to the natural mind, it doesn't make sense. Because here am I, all I have is a, a pot of flour, a pot of uh, flour and a cruise of oil. Let's say the flour is just one pot, a little pot, and the oil is just a little bottle. And then you are saying, use it up for God. Why didn't God rain manna down or rain bread down. He said, you have to give. You have to release it before I can multiply it back to you. That is the principle that the bank of heaven operates on. It's a principle of releasing and receiving. If you don't release, you will not receive. It's as simple as that. Except a grain of wheat falls down to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much grain. John 12, 24. When God wanted many sons, he took his one son and released him, sold him on the earth. He said that he may bring many sons to glory. He made the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Hebrews 2, 10. So God took his one son and released him on, on this earth. Then he received many sons back. God is a giver. And you can't beat God giving. In 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 42 to 44, let's read. When bread was multiplied in Elisha's ministry. 2 Kings chapter 4. And you will see that the bread, there was bread which was multiplied. The bread was multiplied. Okay, verse 42. Then a man of God came from Baal Shalisha and brought, no, then a man came from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruit, 20 loaves of barley bread and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. And he said, give it to the people that they may eat. But his servant said, what? Shall I say this before 100 men? He said again, give the people that they may eat, for thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. So he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. So who do you think will receive the leftover? The man who brought it. And you see, this was first fruit. It was for the Levites. But at that time, the priesthood had gone into idol worship. And there was no genuine priest. And he took the first fruit to the man of God. Elisha. And the man of God said, give it to them to eat. As he gave it to them to eat, the thing multiplied. It multiplied. That is how the principle that governs the bank of heaven operates. When I say there's a bank of heaven, I'm going to prove to you from scripture. That is a bank of heaven. You see, money, money has wings. 
Money has wings. Money can fly. Money is insecure. Money is uncertain. Riches are uncertain. You can have riches today and tomorrow you can be poor. You can have wealth today and tomorrow you are poor. Why? Because money, according to Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23 verse 4 and 5, the Bible talks about the fact that riches have wings. Money can fly. Let's read it. Proverbs 23 verse 4 and 5. It says, do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding. Cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. He says, don't overwork to to be rich. Don't, Don't spend all your time trying to work to be rich. Because he said, if that is all you are thinking about, riches can have wings and they will fly. So, it is in vain to rise up early, sit up late, and eat the bread of sorrow, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. 127. So, because of that, because of the fleeting and the uncertain nature of money, God said, I have a bank. When you release your money into that bank, your money is safe. Your money is secure. Your money is stable. When you release your money into the bank of heaven, it is safe, it is secure, it is stable. Because it's like this. You can, you can keep money in your room. The money is not safe. Somebody will say that my money keeps getting missing. You know, and somebody told me that. And I said, take you to the bank. When you take you to the bank, nobody can come and steal your money. Even if it's spiritual. Because at the bank, when the money reduces, they will pay you the amount you deposited. They will not say, no, a spirit has come to take your money, so like, your money, your money has reduced. So there is more security in putting your money in the bank on this earth than keeping it in your room. Because if your money is in your room and the, the room is on fire, you've lost the money. But if your money is in the bank and the bank is even on fire, you have not lost the money. They have to pay you your money. Is that not it? Yeah. So your money is more secured at the bank than under your bed. In the same way, your riches are more secure when they are true riches, which is riches that connect to the bank of heaven than when it is something that you have worked to get and you have hoarded. It's not secure. Hallelujah. Whenever money assumes eternal dimension, it is deposited in the bank of heaven. When you release, you see, the thing has wings. It will fly away anyway. But when you release it to God, it assumes eternal dimension. That is when the riches become stable and secure. You know, there's a bank called Sound Secure Banking Bank, SSB. And the bank of heaven is the most sound the most secure bank that you can have. He said, he said, if you are rich toward God, he said, if you are not rich toward God, he gave a parable of the rich fool who said, oh, my crops have come. I will expand my barns and I will eat and I will say to my soul, eat and relax. You have many goods stored up for you for the future. Then he said, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you and whose Shall it be all these things you have heaped? Who is it, who is it going to be for? All the things you have ordered. Then he said, so shall it be to anyone who is not rich towards God. Rich towards God means that he has not saved in the bank of heaven. He is only working to get money and consume. He is never thinking about God. That money is not stable. That riches is not stable. It doesn't descend. In Philippians 4.17, Paul talks about that they will have fruit in their account. Philippians 4 verse 17, before he said, my God has applied. Let me read from verse 16. He says, for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. 
Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruits that are bound to your account. He was telling them that when I was a Thessalonica, you sent me aid. You gave to me. And he said, I'm not just seeking your gift, but I'm looking for the fruit that will abound to your account. Which means they have an account and Paul was saying that when you gave to me, you were depositing money in your account. It's like this. Converting your money from local currency to foreign currency because you think foreign currency is, is, more, is more stable. Any money you release at the instance of God, you have converted it from local currency to heavenly currency. Earthly currency to heavenly currency. And the heavenly currency is more stable. Deuteronomy 28 verse 12. Deuteronomy 28 verse 12. Are you there? It says, The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You're talking about the Israelites, the blessings of the law, if they, if they obey the voice of God and hacking diligently. He said, God will open his treasure house. Which means God has a treasure house which he opens on his people. But what you release assumes eternal dimension and it is stored in the treasure house. Come again to Luke 12, 33. Luke 12, 33. Where Jesus also talked about the bank of heaven. It says, verse 32, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags. Listen, money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches, nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He said, provide for yourself money bags. Money bags stands for account. Money bags which do not grow old. He said, how? He said, sell what you have and give arms. He said, sell what you have. Sell what you have and give arms. And by selling what you have, you are exchange, you are, you are, you are converting your money from earthly currency to heavenly currency by selling what you have and giving. That's what he said. He said, when you sell and you give, you have converted your money from earthly currency to heavenly currency. He said, your money bag will not grow old. That means your account in heaven, it doesn't grow old. He said, moth cannot eat it. Do you know moth? Moth talks about inflation and depreciation. It doesn't affect your account in heaven. He said, on this earth, when you heap money somewhere, you lay treasure, moth will come and eat. Moth. Termites, they can come and eat it. But he said, if you provide money back for yourself in heaven and treasures in heaven, he said, that place, no thief will go there. So, it is a form of insurance. It's like keeping your money in a bank. When armed robbers break into a bank and they steal all the money in the bank, you are not affected. Why? You have put your money in the bank and the bank owes you. So whether arm, arm robbers came there, whether the bank got burnt, you, they will have to pay you your money. Your money is secure. In the same way, your money is secure, more secure, better secure in the bank of heaven than even on this earth. So whenever you release to God, your money assumes eternal dimension and you, you provide money back for yourself that does not grow old. Where the moth cannot come, where the thieves cannot come. In other words, even if people are stealing from you, it will never affect you. 
if God gives you the true riches, your money, your, your, your state of prosperity is not affected when even people are stealing your money. It's not affected when there's inflation, it will not be affected. If you get connected to God by releasing what he says release, he says he will connect you to a source which doesn't dry up. That's what he's saying. That is the bank of heaven. That is simply how we keep our money in the bank of heaven. It is secure. It is secure. In Luke 16, 11, he said, if you're going to be faithful with, uh, in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust? The true riches. Luke 16, verse 11. It says, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust? The true riches. What he's saying is that, the unrighteous mammon is talking about money. Money in this world can be used for so many purposes. Mammon controls money in this world. And Jesus is saying that. Now, when you get money, because of the influence of mammon, money itself is not stable. So the only way to stabilize money is to release it to God. Is, is to deposit it in the, in, in, in the bank of heaven. That's the only way to stabilize money. That is why I said that when you pay tight, it's a form of insurance. It's the only way to get God connected to you financially. God's prosperity will never be released if you are not somebody who is like God, giver. So, God's prosperity, God can give you a word on prosperity. You will have to change your nature from somebody who is stingy to somebody who is a giver. Otherwise, that word will not come to pass. You see, it's not only giving that is prosperity or that brings prosperity, but you cannot be, you cannot be prosperous without giving. Giving is a, one of the main pillars of a prosperous life. Giving. Being like God. Having a heart of generosity. A heart a hand that refreshes. But we say, he who refreshes will often be refreshed. He that gives liberally will be given. It's a principle. So, if you see anybody who has prospered, you will check the person's life. There is something about releasing. There is something about giving. Nobody has truly prospered only by hoarding. You will give. Because money is not secure. But the bank of heaven is secure. It has secured guarantees. Number one, it says it does not grow old. It does not fade. It's not defiled. It's safer. There is no inflation that can affect it. And he said, when you are connected to God through that, God is committed to you. Because God knows that your money is with him. And he must give it to you. He said, when you fail, that they may receive you into everlasting habitation. He said, make friends. Make friends with the unrighteous mammon. That when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. Do you know what it means? It means that the money you are, hold, you are holding, money is a, has wings. So, use some of the money to make investment in people's lives. Make Give them to God. Make investment that will let the money assume eternal dimension. So that in times of difficulties, that is what God is going to release to you and more. The value only keeps increasing. Because the director of the bank, he cannot lie. That is the surest guarantee we have. That the director of the bank, the one who owns the bank of heaven, he can't lie. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. He said, God, who cannot lie? He cannot lie. If God says it is more blessed to give than to receive, it's not a lie. God cannot lie. It, 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 is, it is true. 
That is one of the most unbelieved verses in the Bible. And yet, it is very true because God said it. He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Which means that when you receive, you are not blessed. When you, your blessing is not determined by how much you receive, how much you can give. Because the more you can give, the more you will have to give. He said, God will give you seed and bread. The more seed you sow, the more seed and bread he gives you. Your, your, your food portion increases and your seed portion increases. So you will see somebody who is truly prosperous in how his network of giving is expanding. Paul said, as poor, yet making many rich. He said, as poor, and yet making many rich. He said, as dead, and making many alive. He's talking about his life. He looks poor, but he's making many people rich. His network of giving is expanding. God is giving him more. He said, God has given me more than I need and more to also meet other people's needs. That is God's mindset. So, when you release money, anything you release at the instance of God, it hasn't left your life. Maybe it has only left your hand. It will come back to you. And the exchange rate in the bank of heaven is Luke 6.38. That is the exchange rate. Luke 6.38. Anything you give to God, he multiplies by the exchange rate and then gives it back to you. Anything, whether it's time, whether it's love, whether it's money, whether it's resources, whether it's your house, whether it's treasure, whether it's talent, anything you give to God, it says, give, and it should be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. You see, he said, the same measure. So, God will say, you gave a handful. I will also give a handful. And God's hand is bigger than your hand. Like the example I just used a child to do. If you give God two handfuls, I will give you two handfuls. But my hand is bigger. So, whatever you release, he multiplied by good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. It's what you receive. Now, that tells you that when you start giving, you will first receive good measure. It will get to a point, you will receive press down. It gets to a point, it is shaking together. The time will come, you will see running over. I will show you that when we say give, we are not talking about lotto or raffle. Or jackpot where you give and then you say, where is it? No. Giving should be the normal lifestyle of the believer. And the more it becomes your lifestyle, the more God will also be releasing to you. In fact, God has already established as a principle. And so there are many people who are not even believers. They are giving and they are giving and the principle is working for them because it's a principle. It's principles are color blind. They are faith blind. They don't, it's a principle. Whether you, you are, you are a believer or not, that principle will work. There are certain things that are principles. They are not whether you are, God, God doesn't bless because you are just his, his child. No. I'm talking about financial blessing. I mean, when you are born again, you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. All spiritual blessings. But the material financial blessing, you have to activate the principle of releasing and receiving. That is why in the life of the Israelites, God said, oh, they had various offerings. Every little thing, God will say, bring an offering. Everything. You are giving birth to a child. You are going to dedicate a child. 
He said, and this is an offering that you shall offer. If it's a meal, one lamp. If the parents are poor, a turtle dove or a young pigeon. You know, Mary offered that. Which means that Mary didn't have money when Jesus was born. So she, she, she chose the one that, that was for poor people. It was when Jesus grew up, when the wise men came and presented gold, that Mary became rich. Before then, she was not, she was not rich. She was poor. But when the wise men came and gave gold, then they became rich. That was the money they used to sponsor their traveling from Israel to Egypt and all that. And so Jesus grew up in a, in a rich home. In a home that there was gold. <laughs> yeah. So that is the, the, their life, their life were, were always with giving. God would say, give this offering. They had various offerings. Sometimes when you read through the books of Moses, it's, it's even confusing. And the, 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 everything was measured. You have to offer this, a hen of this, uh, one cut of this, uh, one homer of this, one, I mean, everything was, was legislated. They had to give. And God, three times God said, don't appear before me empty handed. Three times. Exodus 23 verse 15. Exodus 34 verse 20. Deuteronomy 16, 16. He says, do not appear before me empty handed. Otherwise, there will be nothing to use to multiply to you. Now, let me talk about how you make deposits into the bank of heaven. Three main financial instruments that you can activate, take advantage of. And God will bless you when you release money in these three main areas. The first one is giving to God. I will explain that. Second one is giving to people. And then third one is tithing or first fruits. In fact, tithing answers the problem of consistent giving. Systematic giving. Consistent giving. Stewardship. Deliverance from mammon. Tithing. If you are not a tither, it means that mammon still has his grip on you. And God will not be able to release the quantum of blessing that he wants to release. That's why everybody must be a tither. At least, if you, if you, if you can't do more than 10%, at least the 10% is what you must do. It's, it's, it's your covenant with God. Now, when it comes to giving to God, I'm talking about Offering that you give in support of God's work, in support of mission work, in support of church, that is giving to God. That is the giving that is, you see, you, you are giving to God. You are not giving to God like God Himself coming down to receive, but you are giving to the church. And when you give to the church, you're giving to God. Because when Paul was persecuting the church, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Meanwhile, Saul was persecuting the church. Which means the church and Jesus are one. Because the church is his body. So, when you give to the church, you are giving to God. And that talks about offering that you give for you when you are coming to God, you must appear before God with an offering. That's why we take offering when we come to church. You must give offering. We see, we pay tithe, but we give offering. For tithe, we pay. But offerings, we give. And giving of offering is a discretionary amount according to your ability. Discretionary not in, in whether you, you can... You can choose not to give or to give. No. But I'm talking about the amount. There is no fixed amount of offering that you can give. It's not like tithing where God said bring a tenth. This one, any amount. But it should be according as God has blessed you. According to your ability. You can you can be giving one CD offering when God has blessed you more than that. I mean, you see, the, the giving 
the giving is is your heart is your heart your your attitude of love we we shouldn't see it as collection <laughs> collection something we are collecting no it is offering offering you see they had burnt offering where you burnt the whole animal to god then they had peace offering meal offering sin offering trespass offering various kinds of offering you can come to god with a thanksgiving offering maybe god has done something for you you come to church you come and put offering in the offering bowl i'm thanking god birthday this my god has added one year i'm thanking god God has delivered me from sickness or my father was sick and God healed him. I'm thanking God. This is not something that the, the church should, should, should come and say, okay, uh, all those who came with thanks. Uh, th-. No, no, no. It's your own heart. It's an attitude of thanksgiving. That is offering. God, you you have a and, and, and why do you bring money? Why is it money that you used to thank God? Because m- number one, Money is the thing you fear most to release. And so that's the thing that can become an idol in your life. Number two, money is what represents your toil, your sweat and your blood. So the, the, the way you can thank God from your heart is by giving. Not just by your lips saying, oh, thank you, Father. I thank you. I bless you. Thank you. When you give, it means that you are really, really grateful for what God did for you. It's giving. And it is always discretionary. Money we, we use to support missions is offering. Support missions is offering. And you see, when you give to the church, what the, the church, the church is supposed to be a place where the storehouses and the money is received and then distributed. Not that you receive money and say it among the members. Not that. But the money was put to right use to help people in the church is one, to help the needy, number two, number three, for the preaching of the gospel. Preaching of the gospel, it needs money. And that's what you must give. That is why if you don't believe in the church, then you, you don't have to give your money. If you can't trust somebody with your soul, you shouldn't trust him with your money. Are you getting me? You can't trust this place with your soul, you shouldn't release your money. Because God says they are the ones who watch over your soul to give account. That's why the man, the man saw that the priesthood had departed from God's way. He took the money, the first fruit, the tithe, and sent it to Elisha. He said, this is the first fruit. People sometimes say that, oh, even if your church, even if it's the thing, I, uh, you are not receiving anything, the tithe should go there. Listen, your tithe should go where you are spiritually fed. Period. By the way, you if that place, you are, you are not spiritually fed, what are you doing there? So why are you putting your money there? It means your money is more important to you than your soul. <laughs> so give it to God. And when you give to God, God will give back to you. He multiplies with the exchange rate. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaking together. Running over. Then it's in your account. There are some givings you have given. When God connects the giving to the blessing, you, you cry. And sometimes God, God will let you know. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes He will let you know that, do you know why this thing came? Remember this offering. You will cry and say, ah, so this little thing I gave, and it's connected to this big thing. Because God doesn't need our money. He only needs seed to multiply back to us so that the principle of life is sustained. Because he knows that when you get a seed, when you get a bread, you get a fruit, you eat the food and plant the seed. 
Now there are some rules concerning giving to God. The first one is it must be according to ability. According to ability. According to ability means according to how much you can give. Sometimes you can give beyond your ability. Yes. That is where pledges come in. A pledge is beyond your ability. And in the Bible, there are two ways you can give. One is according to your ability. One is beyond your ability. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter um, 8. You will see that the people gave in two ways. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of of the ministering to the saints. They gave according to their ability and even beyond their ability. How do you give your ability? That's what I'm talking about. That's, that's why sometimes we pledge. So, when you pledge, you have not sinned. When you want to give, but you know that the money you have you can't give. It's not enough. From what you're going to give, then you have to pledge. Sometimes God can give you an amount to pay or to give. When you know that God is asking you to give hundred cities, when you, when you get the conviction that I want to support this with hundred cities, but I don't have it, but I'm going to pledge so that I will I will pay it. 10 cities, 10 cities, 10 cities. You are giving beyond your ability. Apart from that, all giving should be according to your ability. According to what one has and not one has not. To the only exception is when you God, God says, the amount, the amount God says you should give is bigger than the amount you have. And say, then God will give me grace. And you will see that any giving that God says give, which is beyond your ability. Once you made a commitment, God will begin releasing money for you to pay, for you to give. It is the ones that men of God squeeze your hand to give that you, you don't get money to give and it, it becomes a burden around your neck. You have pledged and you cannot pay and you are also feeling guilty. Because somebody said, give you, give 10,000. You, give 5,000. You know, you don't have money to pay. And so I'll, I'll pay. That, that, I'm, I'm, that's, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you are convicted. We should be led by God in our giving. And when you are truly led by God, that's where you get results. The reason why we don't get results is because we don't give at the instance of God. We don't give in obedience. It is not enough to give, to give a, a big amount. No, it must be in accordance with obedience. God is not just sacri- satisfied with sacrifice. He places obedience before sacrifice. So when you obey God, and you see, you can't beat God when it comes to giving. So when it's God who is telling you to give, you better give. If God says, give 100,000, and you don't have, it's so okay, you say I should give. So, I'm, and God will provide money to give, if it is God who said it should give. Number two, it should be done with simplicity. Romans 12, 8. It said, he who gives, let him do so with simplicity. He was talking about people in the church who are givers. They, 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 we have, we have, we have a gift of giving. And how do you have that gift? When as God blesses you, then you give. 
So there are some people, because they activated that principle, as God increased, as God increased, they also increased their giving. And they became so rich. And when God blessed them financially, the more God blessed them, the more they also released. So they identified as givers in the church. But every believer must be a giver. But there are people who are blessed financially because of their hearts and because they practice this principle, they just loved to give. And God said, I can trust this person with more resources because he will not hoard it. He will release it. And because of that, they became more prosperous than the average believer. And that's why you, that's how you enter into the gift, the, the, the gift of giving, the gift of a giver. Because giving is a grace. Paul said, excel in this grace of giving also. Second Corinthians 8. He said, excel in this grace also. It's a grace. It should be done regularly. It should be done regularly. First Corinthians 16 verse 2. Paul was collecting. That's when we had the word collection. First Corinthians 16. He was, he was collecting money from the, from the church for the saints in Jerusalem because they were going through hardship. And Paul said, uh, on the first day of the week, when you come, according as God has prospered you, set aside something so that when I come, there may not be, there may not be collections when I come. So by the time I come, it's ready, and I'll just take it and go and give it to them. That's what Paul was saying. So, giving should be done regularly. We always say offering time, blessing time, but we don't really mean it. We don't really believe it. But I tell you, it is more blessed to give than to receive. More blessed to give than to receive. So, when you are giving, don't think you are doing somebody a favor. No. No. When you are giving, you are not doing somebody a favor. You are doing your own self a favor. If God says give this person this money, don't think that you are doing him a favor. You are doing your own self a favor. It's not a person. It's you. You are, you are getting the blessing. <laughs> that is why you shouldn't say, eh, I, 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 I give, I gave him this money. And look at what, what, what he, uh, and I, he, no, because it is you who you are getting the blessing. Unless we think that way, we will not be in line with God, God's thinking. That's why God, God is more, even God believes in the principle that it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's why he's always giving. He, he gives without finding fault. James 1 5. He gives lavishly and he abraded not. Why? It's more blessed to give than to receive. It is true. It is more. If You see, the world believes that it's more blessed to receive than to give. That's where we get the idea of savings from. You have to hold and hold and hold. You see, but God is saying that it, it you have to divide, divide and distribute for him to multiply. God's equation is Division and distribution is equal to multiplication. Man's equation is addition and addition is equal to abundance. God says it's a division and distribution that releases abundance. That is kingdom thinking. Now, it says it should be given freely. Matthew 10, 8, freely. Not with any strength. Don't con- don't seek to control the pastor because you gave money to the church. You don't. We don't. It, it should be given freely. The fact that you gave money to the church doesn't mean you can control the pastor. It's not done. You didn't give money to the pastor. You gave to God. He said, "Give freely, freely, no strings attached." <laughs> this is you see. People have turned giving in the church to uh, be equal with giving to political parties or giving to uh, uh, social clubs. You see, when you when 
let's say when uh, you, you give to political party, what, what are you doing? You are telling them that, look, I'm supporting you to do your campaign. When you also come, remember me. That is, that is, that, that is a different thing. When you are giving to the church, it's not a mentality. You're not giving to the church that, oh, I'm giving to you and so this, this, that. No. Then it's not, it's not, it's not a church. Said so they brought all the money and placed the money at the apostles' feet and they went away. <laughs> so why? You, so yes, I'm not saying that a church is not accountable. What I'm saying is that you don't use your giving with strings attached. Not only to the church, even to people. You don't give to people with strings attached. Give freely. But this one, I'm talking about to God. But every giving you give should be free. Give freely from your heart. Give freely. Not that I've given to you, so you um, do this and this and that because I've given to you. Then it's not to God. Then it's not in the bank of heaven. He said, when you give and you receive reward, your giving doesn't get into the bank of heaven. He said that, he said that, when, he said, when you, when you give to those who can pay you back, what profit do you get? He said, but if you give to those who can't pay you back, that is when the money assumes eternal dimension. He said, when you organize a party, why do you invite people who cannot invite you back? Jesus said it. He said, invite those who can invite you back and then you receive reward from heaven. You see, when we say reward from heaven, we think that he's talking about when Jesus comes. No. He's talking about your riches, prosperity, being connected to the eternal realm. He said, sell all you have and give arms to people, to the poor and come and follow me and you will have treasure in heaven. The man thought by selling all he has and giving it to the poor, Jesus was saying that then you become very poor and then that should be ubinya akachia also. Yes, and I used to kind. That was an opportunity for the man to even have doubled his riches. Because he said, there's nobody who will give away lands, riches, or houses for my sake. Who will not receive a thousand times more in this life? So, it was not God trying to strip the man of his riches. It was God giving the man an opportunity to even multiply his riches. But with this time, true riches because mammoth's grip would have been broken over his life. But the man thought he was losing something. It's funny. It's like this. When you are with a child, the child has a little door. You have a bigger one. You have, you have hidden it behind, behind you at your back. And so give me your door. Say, I won't give it to you. Meanwhile, there's a bigger one you want to give to him. Hey. Then he says, give cheerfully. Second Corinthians 9, 7. God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> Somebody said, <laughs> You say we should give. And as we are giving, he said, <laughs> They say, as you are giving, be cheerful too. <laughs> you, are not, you, are not, you are not permitted to show, I mean, your face, don't squeeze your face. No. He said, be cheerful. That means, you, the thing, the thing is paining you, but <laughs> you're you are, you are smiling. You are cheerful. <laughs> yes. 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 So we must prayerfully purpose in our heart the amount you want to give. Before you come for meeting, prepare your offering. The off prepare it. You come and give it. Prepare. Then, we must increase our offering from time to time. As God is blessing you, you must, you must come to a point where you see that one CD, one CD is, is, one CD offering is, is, is below me. I, I have to give two CDs. I mean, because you, God has blessed you more than one CD. Yeah, you, 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 you can, I mean, so, you, it's not like, as for me, it's only one CD I will give every day. <laughs> 
No, what days when you get more, you must give more. And and when you give one city, God will not say, Oh, I give. no, no, because if somebody gave two mites, and Jesus said, The widow has given enough, more than all the rich men. He was talking about percentage wise. She gave hundred percent, two over two. The rich man might have given twenty percent, maybe twenty out of hundred. But she, the two, was all she had. And she gave the two. And look at Jesus. He didn't say, Woman, it's okay, it's okay. Just take your offering and go. <laughs> and I, 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 I know you don't have money. No. And he, Jesus was sitting where the money, they put the money. He was sitting by the offering bowl. <laughs> so it's not true that nobody should see your offering. It's not true. It's not true. The Bible didn't say nobody, nobody should see your offering. It, it says arms. What about offering? Jesus was looking into the box. <laughs> you know, now, you know how they, they do fundraising? For instance, maybe somebody's having a wedding and say the couple will sit there and then they will be receiving the gift. So the, the couple is there and you are coming to a gift and they see you. <laughs> and every man, so you can't just go and, you know, we, we, we often say that, oh, people should use your offering. So when, when you say, tell me offering, you say, we squeeze the money. And you say that all church money, they are always squeezed. <laughs> church money. Oh, church money is under bondage. Squeeze the money. <laughs> liberate, liberate your money. You know, so, oh, it's true. Sometimes when the money is big, there's confidence, you know. <laughs> so, so lift up your offering. You see, those with uh, 20 CD, 10 CD. <laughs> those, those with one CD, fivefold ministry. <laughs> I said, God is powerful. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't say that nobody should see your offering. I mean, if somebody's, and when you give, you see, like people say that, oh, it should be private. So, no. When, when, when you give and people see it, fine, there's no, nothing wrong with that. So, if you always want your offering, uh, people, uh, not to, you know, just make sure you get some green, green, you know, notes or brown. I, I, I read this, uh, this uh, story, I think on WhatsApp, or, and two, two notes were conversing. I think one was 50 CD, one was one CD. And the one CD, asked 50 CD that, do you go to church? Then he said, what is church? <laughs> I, I don't even know church. He said, oh, church. He said, okay, where have you been? So I've been in nightclubs. I've been, you know, places, golden tulip, other places I've been there. I said, oh, really? And the one city said, me, I've not been to those places before. Me, I've been to churches from this church to that church. <laughs> I'm always in church. <laughs> now, the second thing, the second way is, um, Giving to the poor. Giving to the poor. Deuteronomy 15 verse 7, God said, they should give to the poor. And God takes this personally. He takes it personally. It's, it's like God is so mindful of the poor and even the needy. And God has arranged the system in the church said that the poor will find rest. And even in the world, like I said, if the principle that God instituted was adhered to, there will not be poverty in the world. There will not be famine in the world. There will not be shortage in the world. But because the principle was violated and men began to hoard, that is when poverty came into the world. Because God's system was from one according to his ability to one according to his need. And that was what was happening in the early church. So that there was no poor person among them. God is mindful of the poor. Come to Proverbs 19 verse 7. Proverbs 19 verse 7.
It says, all the brothers of the poor hate him. <laughs> no, verse 17. Verse 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. And he will pay back what he has given. He will pay back what he has given. This one, no interest. He will pay you what you have given. <laughs> Proverbs 22, verse 9. But you see, when God says, I will pay you back, you can, you can imagine that it is going to be bigger than what you, what you give. He who has a generous eye will be blessed. For he gives of his bread to the poor. So, and this is one of the financial instruments in the bank of heaven that is very fast. Very, very fast. Giving to the needy is fast. It yields faster. Because God is very mindful of needy people and poor people. And it, it, the reason why it's fast is that it says when you give to the poor, you have lent to God. And God doesn't want to owe. Because he says, oh no man, nothing. So he's in a hurry to pay back. <laughs> so when you give to the poor, God will pay you back. He's in a hurry to do that. I remember once <laughs> I was uh, in the course of administration. Before I came for the program, I had a word of knowledge that there was somebody who had to steal money to come for camp meeting. And uh, because she didn't have money. So I, I shared it. Then after the program, when I was going, the Lord spoke to me that I should give the person 50 CDs. But I didn't tell, I didn't say it with a word of knowledge. I just said there's somebody here. You have to steal money before coming for this car meeting. I won't come. And the person didn't come. But the person came after the program. Of course, you know, God, she, she was shy. But when she came and I asked her and I said, how much did you steal? She said, five cities. Then I understood why God said, give her 50 cities. And I said, uh, what you did, even though you were coming for calm meeting, I know that it's, uh, it's, it's wrong. So, get this money. I said, go and pay back the five cities that you stole from your mother. Go and pay back. You know, and then this is the rest. As soon as she left my presence, somebody came to me with an envelope and said, Daddy, I want to sow this seed. I opened the envelope. It was 50 CDs. I mean, I was so amazed. The <laughs> as soon as she left my present, you know, after, after program, people come and see me. When she left, the person was standing by and she came and said, I want to sow this. And it was the same amount. So when I was going, I said, hey, God. <laughs> Why? Then he said, eh, because if you lend to me, I have to give it back to you. That is where I discovered that if you give money to people, you reap it faster. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you like, you try. <laughs> you use me to try. <laughs> if you want to try, I can offer myself. Just use me to try me. <laughs> so, God God is mindful of the needy. So, always look for a need to meet. You see, when you hear that somebody is expressing a need, that is when you should be happy. One more chance to sow. One more chance to lend to God. If even God doesn't give you any money, this one he will give you. Because he, he himself said, Oh no man, nothing. So he said, I, I'm, you are owing me. I'm giving this, but you are owing me. So, <laughs> no excuse. This, this time, no excuse. Now, when I say the poor, in the Bible, the fatherless, you see, God is very mind, God's mind is on the fatherless. Even more than the motherless. Because, you see, it is the father that must take care of the home. 
And when the father is not there, in most cases, the home, the, the children suffer. And the mother also suffers. And so, in the Bible, God was always mentioning the fatherless. He said, let the fatherless and the widows, the fatherless, the strangers. God is moved by people who have problems. And if you are truly godly, our hearts will be touched by people's needs. Otherwise, we are not godly. Otherwise, if it takes God so long to touch your heart, to give to somebody, it means your heart is very hard. So the fatherless first, or maybe both parents, any money you give to give to help somebody who is fatherless, you have lent to the Lord. That money will never live your life. You are God, God will bless you because when God's heart, heart, his heartfelt desire is that everybody will have a father and a covering. That is God's heartfelt desire. Because the problem in the world is fatherlessness. And whenever God sees us, that's why when there's a death of a father, God raises another father. You see, why do you think they came up with that proverb? Because one of the worst things that can happen to you is to lose your father. That's why people must find fathers in the church. Even if you are a single mother, you must get a father for your children. And you can get it in the church. Somebody, a father figure who they can look up to. The widow is also one. The widow is also one aspect of people that God said we should give to. The widow. You see, any ministry that doesn't have an outreach to the poor is not fulfilling scripture. I'm telling you. If you don't have an outreach to the poor, you are not fulfilling scripture. That's why we have Mission J127. It's not just about just receiving and receiving and receiving and receiving. No. We must have an eye. He said he that has an eye for the poor is generous and God will bless him. Because you have lent to the Lord. Then we talk about people who are unproductive. They cannot work. Invalids. They can't work. They are people who are, the Bible says they are poor. They can't work. They can't work. You see, when I was uh, preparing this this morning, something struck my heart. I began to think about the mad men and the mad women. <laughs> because they, they, they can't work. Who is going to employ them? So if you come across a mad man, a mad woman, and the person says, Give me money, I, I mean you must you must give. Because who takes care of them? Nobody takes care of them. Who's going to employ them? They can't work. People who are blind, people whose one hand is off. You see, these are people who can't work. Who? If you are blind, the, one of the worst things that I can be the person is to be blind. If you are blind, if one hand is off, how can you, how can you tie a rope? You can't use one hand to tie a rope. You need two hands. So, one, somebody with one hand off is somebody who is poor. He can't work. If you have two hands, you can work. If you have two hands, you have eyes, you can work. So, the help you can give such a person is to find a job for the person to do. These are the people that the Bible says we should give arms to. Arms. These people. The less privileged. 
So look for somebody who is in need and meet the person's need. And let God smile on you. And let God's heart be refreshed. That this my child, if I bless him with millions, many people will be released of, of their bedding. Otherwise, God will say, this my child, I know him. If I give him millions now, he will hoard. People will not benefit. So I will not also release. Then we come to the household of faith. The household of faith. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. It says, we should do good to all men, especially to those who belong to the household of faith. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Talking about from the, in the house of God. In the house of God. It must start in the house of God. You can find somebody in the house of God to help. Before you step out to help people. Otherwise, you are becoming a hypocrite. So, he said, let us, especially those of the household of faith, that is one of the financial instruments of the bank of heaven, which you can activate. Then also, we must give to men of God. That is also one financial instrument given to men of God. He said, if I've sown to you spiritual things, is it any big deal if I reap material things from you? 9-11. 1 Corinthians 9-11. That is the 9-11 in the Bible. (laughs) 9-11 in the Bible. You see, Men of God, our one of our favorite verses is this one. <laughs> if I sow spiritual things, you must sow material things. Then we add, <laughs> it is more blessed to give. But you know, that scripture was, was to pastors. Yeah, the one in Acts 20 verse 35, more blessed to give. Paul was talking to efficient pastors. <laughs> Then Galatians 6 says, he said, let him who teaches and he who is taught continue in sharing of good things. So it is a spiritual principle that you you can sow money into the life of a man of God as God directs you. That one too will release a blessing. But don't think that Unless you take money to a man of God, God will not bless you. The key is obedience. If, don't, if you jive by, okay, so if I give this money to a man of God, I will see more blessing. No, obedience is key. When God touches your heart that go and give this money to a man of God and you obey, that obedience will open. And he said, he said, anybody who gives a cup of cold water to a disciple will not lose his reward. He said, if you give a cup of water to a prophet, you will get a prophet's reward. If you give it to your man of God, you will get a reward from the man of God. So, these are financial instruments that you can be using. In the bank of heaven. So that you multiply your seed. You scatter your seed. So you connect yourself. A time will come where you will never lack. Because you are so connected. When it comes to this giving to the poor, you are there. Giving to men of God, you are there. Giving to the church, you are there. Then also. Giving to the Lord's brethren believers. 
every major fundraising in the Bible, in the New Testament, was taken for the church, for the believers. Which means that that is, also, that is one of the financial instruments given to believers. I've thought about that. Then the last one is given to your family. 1 Timothy 5, 8. He says, if anybody does not take care of his family, he is worse than an infidel. Where's an unbeliever? That was serious. Where's an unbeliever? It says, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Talking about your responsibility towards your household. If you you have children, you are married with children, your responsibility to take care of them. You don't neglect your responsibility. Then also, if your parents are old and you have to take care of them, Bible says, honor your father and mother. It means take care of them. When you know, like for instance, like me, for instance, me, I even take money from them. So. <laughs> <laughs> I even take money from them. So I, I, it's like, it's not like, but there are, you, for you, maybe your parents, your parents may need money from you. And you must give. I mean, if it gets to a point where they need money from me, I will give. <laughs> so, only your father and mother. Jesus rebuked them and said, you, you, you tell your father and mother that the money I would have given you is Corban. I'm going to give it to God. So that you deny your responsibility. He said, no, that is not right. It, you, 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 you will give. You will take care. It's your responsibility. Now, let me move to the last one. So, these are financial instruments in the bank of heaven. So, take advantage of them. You know, in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, the Bible gives some advice. You see, when you are a giver, let me show you the stages you go through so that you don't get discouraged. When you start committing yourself to a lifestyle of giving, you, you will first come to a stage where you give and you receive nothing. You are giving, but you are not really receiving anything from the giving you are giving. Why? Unless a grain of wheat falls down to the ground and dies, it abides alone, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit, means there's a process that is initiated. That's why between sowing and reaping, there is patience. In James 5, it says, The farmer waits patiently for the rain that the earth may produce fruit. So when you sow, at, when you start sowing, when you start being, that's why I said it's not a jackpot, it's not lotto, it's a lifestyle. You, you, you sow and keep sowing and keep sowing. At first, you may see nothing. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. He said, cast your bread upon many waters. Upon the waters. For you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight. For you do not know what it will burn. Then come to verse 6. He said, in the morning, sow your seed. And in the evening, do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which one will prosper. Either this or that. Or whether both alike will be good. So he say, scatter your seed. You just sow. You may not reap. That's the first stage. So people sometimes think that as soon as I put in money, I, I must reap money. No, it's not. It, it, it's, it's, you must do it. and do, Even if you don't reap. Believe God's word and do it. Come to Mark 4, 26. 
Look at what Jesus said about sowing. Mark 4, 26. Anything that can be sown, you just, you, you just don't sow and reap just like that. It goes through a process of death. The seed must die before it, it germinates. Anything that is sown, Mark 4, 26, he said, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. He said, when you scatter seed on the ground, you sleep by night and by day. That's talking about cycle, process. Then your seed will grow. So the most important thing is to adopt a lifestyle of giving. You just give because you love God. Then you come to a point where you start receiving. You, 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 God starts showing you the connection between what you give and what you receive. That is when you come to a good measure. God gives you a good measure. You know, it's a good measure. Just what you need. Just what you, you eat. Good measure. You come to understand that scripture. But you still give. It will get to a point where the moment you give, you are receiving. That is where we often make mistakes. We hear fundraisers giving wild testimonies. I went to a meeting and I sold thousand CDs. When I came home, somebody called me and said, I've put 100,000 in your account. Say, gee. Then when you are there, say, oh, where, where, where is my thousand? I see it's like Piram or DKM. <laughs> yeah, that's a, so we, you take your towel in, I'm going to sue. The man of God said, then you go and sue. You get home, it's your landlord who calls you. <laughs> it's your landlord who calls you, say, Master, rent, rent the time. I said, ah, the word of God is not true. The man of God like, no. He was talking from a place where he has been faithful in little things. He has gone to a place where the moment he sowed, he reaped. He reaped. So you too sow, you will reap. At least you will reap, you, you will reap. But it will get to a point where if you are a, 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 a sower, it will get to a point, as soon as you sow, you are reaping. Hey. That is the point where you get to where you never lack. When that is about to finish, you see, it will be provided. As soon as it's about to finish, Provision will come. <laughs> it's also a stage. Then you get to a place, Amos 9:11, Amos 9:13, where the sower overtakes the reaper. The sower overtakes the reaper. It's like whilst you are sowing, even even before you sow, you are reaping. Because you have initiated a lot of, you know, uh, 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 cycles, a lot of processes. So before you even sow, you see that you are reaping. So you are caught in a never ending cycle of releasing and receiving. That is how far you can go. Now you don't, by the time you make up your mind to sow, the money is already there. And you ask yourself, hey, so God, so wait, so the money was there, it was just, I mean, so, because sometimes when God says give, by the time you give, somebody too has given. <laughs> if somebody has given. And sometimes it happens, and then you even, if you delayed in obeying God, you become ashamed. Let's say God says give 200 cities. Then you are delaying. Oh, then before I realize, someone has given you 500. They say, oh, so God was saying I should give 200 because 500 was coming. Then you'll be ashamed. Then you now go and give the 200. He <laughs> said, so God says I should give 200. <laughs> then you come to the last point. Where you reap what you have not sown. In John 4, 38. Jesus to the disciples. 
He said, I'm sending you to reap where you have not sown. It's also a stage. That is the last stage. Where you have not sown, you are reaping. Why? Because you have cultivated the lifestyle of giving. Let us pray that God will give us grace. Let's be givers. Don't be afraid to give. Don't be afraid to give. You see, giving releases you from the grip of mammon and giving rele- teaches you faith. Because as you are giving, you don't know how you're going to receive it back, but you are still giving. And it trains you, it gives you endurance. It gives you perseverance. It makes you strong in the faith. So people who are givers, they are people of faith. You will see that they are people of faith. They always give. Not because they have abundance, but they have a heart, a, a large heart unto God. So if you put money in the bank of heaven, your money will not, you will never lack. God will always make it up to you. So I've given you the financial instruments. Use them. If like you can, you can decide to try them and see. You see that they will work. Let's pray. Ma wa dum no nye kesi e ra die Ma wa dum no nye kesi Oh ma wa dum no nye kesi e ra die Ma wa dum no Yekesi O ma usra nu Enye ma O ma wadum nu Emrusu O ma usra nu Enye ma O ma wa do no e ke si O ma wa do no e ke si E ra die Ma wa do no e ke si O ma wa do no ye ke si E ra die Ma wa do no ye ke si O ma ro sra no E ye ma O Ma wa do no em ru so o ma o sa no e ye ma o ma wa do no ye ke sin we are praying that God should release grace God should give us grace. Grace to release what he has given us. Grace of giving. Paul said, excel in this grace also. I baliando lo boko si hata ramata ya gindo lo koshan moki ana hasi yanda kombra talia nere bikoshi brutal ya talama hata ingolo go si kahata rapata ya la busi yadi reboko si hata brande pratusha mandala bakuta hata 
ikalisia daha ro pahata ya laha ro mahalim rima talamaha grant us grace oh god grace to give oh god grace to release 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 oh god cobra hata ya la si andara hata kori andara basi inda we are praying this prayer we are praying that whatever seed we have released that God should release rain let the rain be released you see God was showing me something see is the seed that is sown with understanding that yields crops he said the seed that fell on the wayside it it was not planted so the best of the egg came and stole it but the seed that was sown in a good soil he said they are the ones who receive the word and understand it and with patience they bear fruit some 34 64 hundred fold we are praying that god should release rain rain on our soil rain on our soil soften our soil soften our soil that every seed that we sow it will be sown in understanding shown in obedience to god's conviction and that we will see the results let's begin to pray in the name of Jesus. We are praying this last prayer. We are praying for this nation. God has given us a lot of seeds. But we need wise managers to manage our seeds. We are praying for the government, the president, those around him, the ministers, that God should give them supernatural wisdom. That they can manage the seeds that God has given us. That we will receive fruit in this nation. That prosperity will come to this nation. You see, one, one thing that God showed me was that we have entered into Solomonic times so where Solomon built the temple of God. And that is a sign. And we need to pray that wisdom will be added. Wisdom that they can build. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus. Grant them wisdom, O God. In the name of Jesus. Grant them wisdom. To build this country. Oh, that Ghana will enter into her destiny. That Ghana will step into her destiny. That Ghana will step into fruitful seasons. That Ghana will experience abundance and prosperity. In the name of Jesus. That your commission in Ghana, the church in Ghana will prosper. That your mandate and assignment will grow. And that your cities will yet be spread abroad. Through prosperity. Let there be prosperity in this nation. Give our leaders wisdom. Oh, give them wisdom. Give them wisdom. Let them be open to godly influence. Let them be open to godly influence. Let them be open to sound advice. Godly advice. Bring godly people their way. Bring spiritual people their way, oh God. In the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we thank you. We bless your name. We pray, oh God, that you release this grace of giving on this ministry, on everybody. Release this grace, oh God, for you have said that it is that attitude of giving that will activate all the various words of prosperity you have released upon us. Give us the grace not to slack in giving. And give us the boldness to step out and trust you in our giving life. Knowing that you cannot lie and you will never fail. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus name. 
Amen. Hallelujah.